We're continuing our series, Untwisting the Parables. And I must say again, the reason Jesus taught in parables was not so people could understand. He taught so people would not un understand. The disciples asked him in Matthew 13, Lord, why, why do you speak in parables? He says, so that they will not understand. But it has been given to you. Who's you? Those whom the Father has given ears to hear and a mind to understand. We must realize the only reason we understand or desire the word of God is because of the grace of God. There's nothing special about us. And there's nothing special about me. Can I get a witness in here? There's <laughs> nothing special about me. The only thing special about us is the special love that God has shown to us. Today, we're looking at the sheep and the goats, the sheep and the goats. This is one parable that has been often misquoted, and we're going to see one text that is just so commonly misquoted. So we're going to jump right into it, begin, beginning in Matthew 25, verse 31. But when the Son of Man, meaning Jesus Christ in the flesh, comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Jesus, his title is the son of man. It means that he will return in the form in which he left. Jesus is all God and he's all man. He is all human and all God at the same time. Note it says the son of man. He is not a son of man. He is the son of man, meaning that he is the preeminent one amongst many brethren. In other words, just as they had back in the Old Testament, they would have the birthright and the firstborn receive the majority of what the father had. Jesus Christ is the firstborn and call him the firstborn of the dead, meaning that he is the firstborn, the first human being that was ever raised from the dead, never to die again. So Jesus Christ is the son of man, and he will sit on his glorious throne. He is God made flesh, born of a virgin who was in all points tempted, just as you and me. Think about it. When he comes again, you will see a human being who is all God. Verse 32, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Verse 33, and he will put the sheep, his elect, that's very important. He will put the sheep, his elect, on his right and the goats, the unrighteous, on his left. Verse 34, then the king, meaning Jesus Christ, will say to those on his right, who's on the right? The sheep, the elect. Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Many people miss this point here. He says, come, you who are blessed of my father. The blessing is not just that they're going into the kingdom. The blessing is what happened before they got into the kingdom. So in what way are they blessed? First, they are blessed to inherit the kingdom, but also they are blessed with a blessing that God reserved, especially for his elect. And many people don't like that word elect. Many people don't like the word chosen. Many people don't like the word predestined. I have no problem with it because it's in the scripture. And if it's in the scripture, I'm going to read it and I'm going to believe what it says. Forget about what I was taught. I was taught, well, you're saved by your own will. Well, we're going to find out that's not exactly true. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. If you are one of his sheep, then you are already blessed with every, with every spiritual blessing the moment you believe. I've said it over and over again. You will get no more of God than what you have right now. 
There is no more God you need to be godly. God has given you every, every ounce of, of himself. The problem is, is that we haven't given every ounce of ourselves. The message of the gospel is that you must deny yourself and follow him. Take up your cross. It's dying to self. But people don't want to die. Oh, Lord, if I just had more of you, I wouldn't sin anymore. Oh, that sounds very much like Adam and Eve in the garden. In the garden, Adam said, is this woman you gave me that caused me to sin? In other words, it's your fault. And then Eve said, if you hadn't given me this serpent, I wouldn't have sinned. In other words, God is your fault because you created this serpent. When you will know you are truly saved when you stop blaming God and take the credit for your own sin. Amen. That is the first step of repentance. People will go around saying, well, I grew up, my, my mom was like this, my daddy's like that. And oh, don't look at my cousins. They all crazy. That has nothing to do with nothing. The gospel is not about how you were born. It is not about, wh about which family you were born into. It's not about which sinful traits you inherited. It's about inheriting the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ who saves you from your sin. Now, these spiritual blessings include the gifts of saving faith. And endurance. He that endures to the end shall be saved. Well, how are you saved? By grace through faith. Without the grace of God, you would not endure. Therefore, since you've received the grace of God, you will endure. Amen. And how do you do it? Believing that. That's what's called faith. Verse 4 of Ephesians 1. Just as he chose. What's another word for chose? elected, just as he chose us in him, meaning Christ, before the foundation of the world. For what? That we should be holy and blameless before him. What's another term for that? That you would be saved. In love, verse five, he predest. Uh oh, you better not say that word, Dana. People get mad with you. In love. In what? In love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of our own free will. Hmm? I'm sorry. Am I reading that wrong? Yeah. And a lot of people think the wrong way about that, too. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. That's a blessing, isn't it? That he looked upon you and said, come here. Why? Because I'm so good. Stop thinking so highly of yourself. Just come here. <laughs> I'm saving you because I want to save you. But why, Lord? For Oh, this is why. Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his Grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Who's us in this in this phrase? The elect, those he chose. How many times people will read that and go, well, 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 that's not what it means. OK, I don't know what Bible you're reading. But this is what it says. And as children of God, we should be happy. That's what it says. Let's go to verse 20, verse 31 in Matthew 24. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together all those who chose him by their own free will. They'll gather together his elect, both Jews and Gentiles chosen by God. Did we see that in Ephesians 1? Well, come on, my name is Dana. You can talk back. Did we see that in Ephesians 1? Where would they come from? From the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. The elect will be gathered by grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ alone, generated by the Holy Spirit alone, not because of their works. No one can inherit the kingdom by their works. 
That's what he told the rich young ruler. That's what he's all the time. Romans tells us no one will inherit the kingdom by their works. Works confirm the work done in a believer. Works confirm that God has truly saved you. So Jesus said this was going back, going back to the parable of, of the goat, the sheep and the goats. Verse 35, for I was hungry. This, isn't that a work? I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. That's the work. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. This is where a lot of denominations got off the rails. They went off the rails. In the 1800s, there were people who started saying, oh, no, we just can't preach the gospel. We have to do something to make the world a better place. We have to do what the sheep do. We have to feed the hungry. We have to give water to the thirsty. We have to let all strangers in. And we have to clothe them. And we must go visit them when they're sick. And we must go visit them in prison. All of those things are good things, but that is not, is, that is not what's being addressed here. If you don't understand that, you will think, forget the gospel and let's just take care of the poor. Question, how was Jesus hungry? Was Jesus, during, during the time here on earth, have you ever seen Jesus hungry? Have you seen him thirsty or a stranger? See, people think, they take the text, you need to welcome in strangers because by that you may have welcomed in angels. First of all, if they're talking crazy and out of their mind, they're not an angel. What he's talking about are those who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. In context, he was saying those who are sent by God. In the Old Testament and New Testament times, those who went out to preach the gospel went everywhere. They had nowhere to stay. So they would stay in strangers' homes and though they would welcome their, them in. And therefore, when they welcomed those who were preaching the word of God, they would never know. They could have been invited an angel. An angel is not going to look just like any Tom, Dick, and Harry off the street. You will know them by their works. But people say, oh, we got to let everybody in. Well, I, like I said Wednesday night, I got a pretty little lady at home who might have a little problem with that. Open the door and let everybody in. You'd have a problem with that. You have children. You're going to just let everybody in your house? No, you see, we have to use our minds. We got, True, true Christianity is starts in the mind. God gives a mind so we can think, not feel. Jesus here is identifying himself with a specific group of people. Here, specifically, those who suffer through the tribulation for the sake of the gospel. During the tribulation, there were those who will be hungry. Why? Because you will, neither, you will not be able to either sell or buy. They will be thirsty because they will be out. They have nowhere to go, no water. They will be strangers because people will shut their doors to them. They will be naked because their clothes, they won't have the clothes to wear. They will be sick and they will be in prison for the sake of the gospel. And if we don't understand that, we will get this whole parable all twisted. Verse 37, then the righteous, meaning the sheep on the right, will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? Verse 38, and when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? That's a really good question, isn't it? That's the appropriate question. Verse 39, when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. Is that what it says? No. Truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine. Who are they? Your fellow sheep. Even the least of them, you did it to me. 
When we are saved, we are identified with Christ and Christ is identified with us. Why was Jesus baptized? So that he would identify with us. Jesus didn't have, he didn't have any sin, but he was baptized to be identified with us. When we are saved, Jesus Christ lives in us. So he's saying, if you did it to one of your fellow sheep, you've done it unto me. He didn't say the least of these. He didn't say everybody in the world. He didn't say everybody who's in need. He didn't say that. And that's important. Well, David, that means you don't care about. Yes, I do care. But I care about the family of God first. How many times you see churches that feed everybody that comes up? They don't care what they don't care what they are into. They don't care. We just need to feed them. No, you don't. Because the scripture says if you don't work. All right. Lord willing, next week, we're going to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. And that's going to bear that out. People will use that parable to say, oh, we need, the purpose of the church is to feed everybody. Yes, the word of God. Amen, Dana. You preaching this morning. <laughs> so he did not say everybody. So here's the question. Who are these brothers of his? Who are the brothers of, of Christ? On one occasion, Jesus was in a location and someone came and said, your mother and your brothers are wanting to see you. And he stated exactly who his brethren are in Matthew 12, verse 50. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. See, we have this idea that everyone is a child of God. Not according to scripture. The only ones who are children of God are those who are led by the spirit of God. We are all made in the image of God, but we're not all children of God. Well, how do you know? Because only the children of God will inherit the kingdom. Those made in his image will still go to hell. Amen. So we must understand this, that he says, those who do my will. The next logical question is, what is the will of God? Simple. People say, you can't know the will of God. Yes, you can. Yes, you, uh, yes, you can. 1 John 3, 23. This is, this is his commandment or his will. That we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love everybody. And love one another, just as he commanded us in John 13, 35, he said, by this, they will know you are my disciples. By what? He said, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. You're not known as God's disciple because of what you do for everybody on the planet. You are known to be God's disciple by what you do with one another, with fellow believers. But we got this twisted idea. Well, you know, we used to have soup here. We talked about this Wednesday night. We used to have soup here on Wednesday night. Oh, we wanted the people to come. You know, we're the church. We're supposed to feed the hungry. Well, we feed them. And then they would, as Glennis so astutely says, they eat, burp, and leave. When it's time for the service to start. Oh, 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 I got a math test to study for. Been out of school for 30 years. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm busy. Well, you weren't too busy to eat up the soup two or three times. The purpose is not to, you see, what happens when we don't think the right way, we're helping sinners to be healthy to continue in their sin. And we think we're doing something good. Jesus did not feed near a person who did not first listen to what he had to say. Mm hmm. That's why I. I'm not. Anyway, let me, let me not go there. Amen. So this is the commandment that we love one another. The sheep. Verse 24. The one who keeps his commandments or does the will of God abides in him, abides in God and he in, in him. We know by this 
that he abides in us. By what? By the spirit whom he has given us. Those who are the children of God, those who are the sheep of God, are possessed and possess the Holy Spirit of God. It is the Spirit of God working in us who enables us to love God and to love one another. It sure ain't us. It's the Spirit of God. Now, after pronouncing the blessing on the sheep, the king will turn his attention to the goats. Matthew 25, verse 41. Then he will also say to those on his left, the unrighteous goats, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. God did not prepare hell, the eternal fire, for people. See, people say you believe in that predestination stuff. So God predestined some to eternal life, and he predestined others for hell. No, he didn't. No, 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 no. You got that twisted. Every last one of us deserved hell. Every last one of us. We were all born wretched. We were all born enemies of God. But God chose to save some. Everyone else gets what they deserve. If we deserve grace, it's no longer grace. If we deserve mercy, it's no longer mercy. Everyone who goes to hell gets what they deserve, and everyone who goes to heaven gets what they don't deserve. I won't deserve to be in heaven. The only reason why we're there is grace. Grace, amazing grace. So what's the difference between a believer and an unbeliever? Our sins as believers were placed on Jesus Christ. And he bore our sins on the cross. And by grace through faith, his righteousness is credited to you. You're not going to get to heaven because you're good. You're going to get to heaven because God is good. And that the works of Jesus Christ are credited to you. Verse 42, he will say to the goats, for I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. Verse 43, I was a stranger and you did not invite me in naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Verse 44, then they themselves who the goats also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you. Remember, among the goats will be religious people. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do this in your name? Did we not give you something to drink? Didn't we invite you in? And what is he going to say to them? To them? Depart from me, you doers of iniquity. I never knew you. Why? Because they were doing it, trying to work their way into heaven. They were not doing it by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Most Christians sitting in service this morning think that they can get to heaven by their works. I heard a preacher say this. It was so good. His young five-year-old son said, uh, he said, how do you get to heaven? He said, it's easy. You die. It's this idea. You've been to funerals. Where someone who didn't live a godly life, and you know it, they die, and then all of a sudden they're transformed into a saint. And you sit there and go, are they talking about the same person? You ever been there? All right. <laughs> Let me dispel this myth. You don't get to heaven because you die physically. You get to heaven because you die spiritually to yourself. By the grace of God, you don't get to heaven because of your works. You don't get to heaven because you were baptized, because you speak in the tongue. Or none of that. You keep the Sabbath, uh, you feed the poor. None of that. All of our righteousness is as filthy dung. All of it. We get there by the righteousness of Christ alone. Verse 45. Then he will answer them. Truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, my brethren, sheep, elect ones, you did not do it to me. So here is the king. The sheep are on the right. The goats are on the left. And so he will say to the ones on the left, 
You will, you did not feed me. You did not clothe me. You did not invite me in. And they're going to say, when did we do it? When you did not do it to the least of these, my sheep, you didn't do it to me. Does that make the whole parable clearer? Because he said that the angels will gather the elect. So the parable is not about you starting a feeding ministry. It is not about you starting a clothing ministry. The parable is about the grace of God that causes you to do the things that Please, God, is how you will know who the elect of God are. You will know who they are by what they do. Verse 46. These, meaning the goats, the unrighteous goats, will go away into eternal punishment. But the sheep, can someone say bad? <laughs> but the sheep into eternal life. I'm so glad I'm a sheep. I know sometimes when things get tough, you start praying, you go, oh, Lord, bad. You start calling on his name. You're trusting in him. How many times when you don't know what to do, you, you know, this, this fear and panic come over you. But the first, then you, get, you, you come to your senses and you go, oh, God, oh, God, help me. Help me. Your trust is not in yourself. That's how you know you're one of his sheep. So the goats will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. King David understood the blessing of being one of God's sheep. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then he rings the bell. Ding, ding, ding. Announcing the bonus round. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord <laughs> forever. Only the sheep. So I wanted to close with this good news for you. Of everything, remember, God saves, he saves alone. And he's coming for his sheep. So David said this about the sheep. I love it. Psalm 100 verse 3. No recognize, remember that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the what? Sheep of his pasture. Why are you the sheep of his pasture? Because he himself is God and he made us his sheep, not we ourselves. Isn't that good news? And so when you read the parable, he's talking about you. He's talking about how you will know the elect from those who are not elect. And he's telling you the promise that he's coming back for you. Even though things will get bad, even though you may have to go through tribulations and trials, let not your heart be troubled. He's coming back for you. Blessed are you for they persecuted the prophets which were before you. Oh, but he's coming again and you're going to see him in all of his glory and you're going to stand around him and you're going to be with him from eternity to eternity and you will worship him forever and forever and forever and forever and you will always declare you are my shepherd because as you are my shepherd, I will never want. Amen. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Amen. Father, we praise you and thank you. Because we know this, we can say it as well with our souls. Because we believe this, we have hope today. Because we know this and know that you live, we can face tomorrow. Thank you, Lord. May we ever remember your faithfulness, your goodness, and your kindness toward us. Lord, we worship you and thank you. Thank you for calling us and saving us and keeping us clean by your word. We worship you and thank you and thank you and thank you. In Jesus' name, 
Amen.